are so excited that you are tuning in for today's Flipgrid live event. My name is Anne and I work on Team Flipgrid and we are so excited to welcome Russell and Sophia today joining us from Incredible Oceans. Before we get started, let me just say this. If you're not sure what Flipgrid is, we are a free video communication platform from Microsoft, and we are on a mission to empower every person on the planet to share their voice and respect the diverse voices of others. That's why we are so excited about today's event with Incredible Oceans. They are working to engage students like you using the science and art of communicating about life below water. Today, Russell and Sophia will be telling us all about whales, waves, and walruses. Oh my. So without further ado, here's Russell. Hello, everyone. My name's Russell. Uh, and as you probably tell from my accent, I am currently based in the United Kingdom, specifically Wales, which is quite cool because that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. Not the animal, sorry, the animal, not the country. Anyway, so before I get go and get lost, we've got some shout outs to do because we've got people tuning in from all over the world, which is awesome. So I'd like to say hello to Mr. Edwards class in Alberta, Canada. And to Mrs. Edwards class in Tabor and to Mr. Gamachi's class in Ontario, Canada. And we've got people from BC in Canada. Why is everyone from Canada? We've got Mrs. Cope's class from Fort McLeod in Canada. We've got people from Atlanta, Georgia, Oahu, Hawaii, Florida, Egypt, and I'm so excited about this one, the United Arab Emirates, which is actually where I grew up. So if you're at Dubai College or Dubai English Speaking School, then you get an extra high five for that. If not, you're still cool for living in the UAE. Right. Uh, anyway, that's me. I'm Russell. I'm an oceanographer. I study plankton and I'm going to here today to talk to you about loads of cool things, uh, whales, waves and walruses. And I'm going to pass down. I think that's where she is right now. Sophia, go for it. Hello, everyone. I'm Sophia. And again, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm also from the United Kingdom. Not quite the same bit as Russell, though. Thank you so much for the intro, Anne and Russell. That was brilliant. So just to let you know what we're going to be up to today, we're going to be learning all about under the sea. We've got a whale video for you all about sperm whales, which dive to the deepest part of the ocean. Then we're going to do a video all about waves and about coastal erosion. And we're going to follow that one up with a video all about walruses as well. And we're going to do a little bit of a sneaky trip around the UK coastline. And you're going to get to see some really nice places in the UK in case you ever come to visit, because I feel like a lot of you might want to do that after this live stream. So without further ado, should we get started, Russell? Totally. So this is a thing I'm really excited about this uh, all the time. You can't be a marine biologist or an oceanographer without people saying, what's your favourite animal? And so I decided to make this video about what I think is one of my favourite sea creatures of all time. So let's kick it off. The sperm whale is definitely one of the coolest creatures on earth. Not only does its name instill hysterical giggles in all teenage boys, but it also holds a number of world records. First of all, it is the largest carnivore on earth. The females are typically around 20 meters long, while the big bull males can be up to 25 meters long. That's the same length as a school bus. Secondly, they are the loudest animal on earth. You've probably walked past roadworks before and noticed the people there wearing ear defenders to protect their hearing. This sound is about 120 decibels. And if they're exposed to this sound level all day, they would quickly damage their ears. But sperm whale clicks of up to 240 decibels have been recorded in the ocean. This sound is 1,200 times more powerful than the sound from roadworks. The sound is so loud that people swimming next to sperm whales have been knocked unconscious. 
But because the particles in water are much closer together than they are in air, it means that sound can travel much further and much faster in the ocean. Scientists think that sperm whales are so loud that one sperm whale can speak to another anywhere on Earth. That's like me being able to shout to my sister in New Zealand. Finally, sperm whales hold the world record for having the biggest brains on Earth. If you put both of your fists together, that's roughly the same size as your brain. But a sperm whale's brain is almost half a metre across. And because it has the same cell density, as well as the deep grooves and furrows that our brain has, scientists think that sperm whales might be more intelligent than humans, but in a way that our feeble human brains don't understand. It's easy to think that's the reason why sperm whales have such funny shaped heads. But in fact, a sperm whale's head is full of a weird, waxy, oily substance called spermaceti. And it's that that gives the sperm whale its name. This waxy oil helps the sperm whale produce its super loud sound. It also helps it dive deep underwater. We're used to thinking of sperm whales as surface creatures, but in fact, they only spend 10 minutes out of every hour at the surface, breathing in the air. The rest of the time, they hold their breath, diving down to depths of about 2,000 meters to hunt for their favorite food, giant squids. That's right, sperm whales are so hardcore, they eat giant squids for breakfast. At this depth, it's so deep that light can't penetrate. So sperm whales can't use their eyes. Instead, they have to use their ears. You might have heard that bats use echolocation to see in the dark. They send out a sound pulse, which echoes off an object and comes back to them. The longer the time difference between sending out the sound and getting it back means the object is further away. But the sperm whale can not only tell how far away something is using sound, they can also see or hear what shape it is, what it's made from, what direction it's going, how fast it's going, and they can even see inside it. And all that just using sound. And that's why sperm whales are awesome. There we go. Enough said. What an amazing creature. They're so fantastic, aren't they? And I think what's amazing about them, especially when we're on a live stream like this, where there's so many of us from all across the world, is that sperm whales have one of the biggest distributions out of any species of whales. So pretty much wherever you are, you've got a chance of seeing a sperm whale. So keep that in mind next time you're on a boat. Keep your eyes peeled. They look a bit like a big grey log floating in the water. Um, and yeah, you might get to see something really, really cool. So we, got, where should we I go was, next, Russell? Well, I was going to show off because obviously sp I love sperm whales so much. I was going to show off some of the cool sperm whale things I have right here. Just really <gasps> yes! quickly because I know we haven't got much time. So one of the first things I've got is this. And this is an actual sperm whale's tooth. Um, so this one uh, is you might notice there's pictures all over it. I'm just going to take it back so it's not so washed out. Um, so this one is from the 1700s and what obviously we used to go and we used to hunt whales out of places like Nantucket on the east coast of the US and that's where we got all the oil from uh, because before we figured out that we got it underground we would go and hunt whales and boil it down and all of the machines that we had were lubricated using whale oil and all the candles we used to make using that so in between cutting up whales the sailors used to take the teeth out the skeleton and they get a little needle and they would scratch patterns into the tooth and then like rub ink into it so i don't know if you can see there but that is there he comes there we go that is admiral how there we go and that was the ship that he used to sail on so that's pretty cool that's my first that's sperm whale thing huge russell it's massive that is a big tooth well they eat giant squid so you need pretty big teeth hey um <laughs> second thing i've got and I, I really love this so we talked about how loud sperm whales were in that last video and uh so in the human ear we've got three little bones which are the smallest bones in the human body uh, we've got one, it's called the hammer. We've got one called the anvil and one called the stirrup because that's kind of what they look like. And they move together and they vibrate backwards and forwards. And that's how we hear things. But obviously in a sperm whale, because they're so loud, they need the world's biggest ear bones. And so this looks like a seashell, but this is actually 
a sperm whale in an ear bone. How it's cool. bigger than your ear. And I didn't think anything was bigger than your ear, hey, to darling, be honest. I've got, I've got fairly <laughs> big ears, it has to be said. There we go. But yes, imagine if you had ear bones that, that big. It would be crazy. There we go. I love sperm whales. They're awesome. So yeah, respect to the sperm whales. Okay. Big respect. I mean, so we are here really to talk about climate change and reducing our carbon footprint today. We just thought we'd put a sperm whale in there because they're really awesome and they're our favourites. I, I would like to just quickly add that actually whales do play an important part in reducing climate change before you dismiss them like that. They do, okay, okay. There we go, because as they swim up and down, they mix nutrients from the bottom up into the surface, which lets plankton grow, and then the plankton take in all the carbon dioxide, then sink and die and go into the deep sea. So there, <laughs> whales do help climate change. Whoa, I'll okay, okay, I was wrong. I, I'll admit that. That was a very quick, quick fire explanation, that one. Um, I'm quite impressed at the speed. But anyway, let's move on to what we're really here to talk about, which is climate change. And one of the biggest impacts of climate change is rising sea levels. Now, oops, Sorry Daisy, I accidentally pressed something there. Um, rising sea levels have a huge impact on our coastlines because they create bigger waves, more water, and then you're going to have lots more erosion and our cliffs are going to disappear. But did you know that sea levels actually rise for other reasons as well? So we're going to learn about the difference between sea level rise because of climate change and a different kind of sea level rise. So, Russell, do you want, now would you like to press play on the video? I'll press play on that. I'll press play <laughs> there on we that. Go. Next video. Well, it's still. the same video. I want the next video. Sorry about that. Here we go. One all about waves. What's up, ocean friends? Welcome back to another episode of Incredible Oceans TV. We're going to talk about coastal erosion today and coastal sea defences. And there's no better place to do that than on the Suffolk coastline, which is one of the fastest eroding coastlines in the UK. As you can see all around me, there's a ton of sand. That's because the main geology here is sandstone and it's a really soft, easily erodible rock. Slightly higher up behind me, you can see a slightly harder rock. And this is because the roots of the plants are binding this soil together. But what coastal defences do we have around Suffolk? And how are they using these to protect the Suffolk coastline? So there's two different kinds of ways we can protect our coastline. There's hard engineering, and there's soft engineering. Hard engineering is like what you see behind me. It's physical things that humans have put on the beach to break up the wave energy and protect the cliffs. It's things like these geotextile bags, which are filled with rocks and aim to keep sediment on the beach where it is. Really good idea. Stops our beaches disappearing, but we do sometimes find bits of these bags pop up on other beaches. So this is Thorpness Beach, and we'll find bits of that bag a couple of miles that way. Not great for our ocean, not great for our ocean animals either, but it is a really good solution to coastal erosion. We've also got these wire cages, which are called gabions. They're filled with bigger rocks, and the aim is it's like a seawall and it deflects away the energy of the waves. So the gabions break up the wave energy. They do this by deflecting the water in several different directions at once. So when I throw a bucket of water at a regular beach, it comes back in my face and I get very wet. But when I throw a bucket of water at this wall, no backsplash. Really cool. Up above them, behind me, you can see the vegetated area of the cliff. The roots of the plant bind the soil together and help protect it from erosion. So this is a slightly different form of engineering and this is what we call soft engineering, which is using natural defences like plants to protect our coastline against erosion. Another example of this is just a few miles down the beach from Thorp Ness here, we have a salt marsh. Salt marshes are also really good at absorbing wave energy, a bit similar to this. They're home to lots of different plants and wildlife, things like sorrel, wild lavender, sea lavender, and they're really good nurseries for fish as well. Really diverse and quite rare habitats. So that's a really nice way of protecting our coasts as well. 
So those are some basic sea defences that we see all along the Suffolk coastline. And next time you're out and about, make sure you have a look out for them. Please don't climb on them, be really careful. Always stay two metres away from a cliff edge. And I hope you really enjoyed this episode of Incredible Ocean. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Well, hey, there we go. That's one of my favourites, that is. It's not the video I thought it was going to be. I was just talking about sea level rise um, and the difference between sea level rise as a result of um, melting ice as a result of climate change. But there's a different kind of sea level rise. I didn't mention that video that I thought I was going to mention in that video. Um, and that is called isostatic rebound. Now that isostatic is a rebound. Isostatic rebound. Yeah. Okay. okay. Write it down. I'll spell it. I S O S T A T I C. This is fascinating. Probably. <laughs> Amazing. You're so yeah. good at spelling. Thank you so much. Um, so basically, in the last time we had glaciers covering the UK, just the top of the UK had ice on it. But because the ice is so heavy it weighed down the land and the south of the UK came up but now that ice has gone all that land is readjusting itself so the south of the UK is sinking so actually sea level rise for us isn't as a result of climate change it's as a result of that land readjusting itself which I okay. think is really cool but I'm also a huge nerd so so I'm just thinking about this because we've got lots of people watching from Canada and obviously the ice at the last glacier, the, most of Canada was covered. So and then that's melted. So I guess Canada is coming out of the Earth's mantle and bits of maybe um, uh, of the US are sinking in. I don't know. Quite possibly. I might need to look that one up, actually. Yeah. You, you anyway. like, so, did you like my, my impression of it? This is this is uh, the, the North American continent moving. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm a continent moving. There we go. So, yes. Uh, but yeah, where you were in Suffolk uh, in that video, it's an area in the east of the uh, of England and it's undergoing. It's like the place in England where the most coast is eroding and the waves are coming and they're just washing it into the sea. And as a result, there's like cliffs and things all over the place where people's houses are just falling into the sea and there's roads that just fall off the edge of the cliff. And obviously climate change is one of the things that's making the waves bigger. It's making us stormier, isn't it? Which Absolutely. is a slightly worrying thing. Um, so, so speaking of the effects of climate change, Russell, what, what is another effect of climate change? Maybe something to do with animals. Well, we've done whales, we've done waves. So the last one is walruses. And the weird thing here is that you guys, there's a lot of people watching from Canada, you guys have got walruses like around the north there. So you guys are like, yeah, walruses, we're used to those. Yeah, I get it, we've got walruses. But you do not expect to see them on the south coast of the United Kingdom. And just up the road from me, all of a sudden, this walrus appeared earlier this year and everyone was like, why is there a walrus here? So I got together with my friend, uh, Claudia, who is a marine mammologist. That's someone who studies marine mammals. Like, so she studies whales and dolphins, porpoises, but she also looks at walruses. And I said, hey, can you come and like tell me some stuff about it? So we went on a hunt to try and find this famous walrus who just appeared here. His name's Wally. So let's find out about walruses. And I'll link this back to climate change in just a sec. Right. Exciting. I think this is it. This is not it. Here we go. Go. Press the play. What is oh, come on. What is a walrus? And why is there a walrus in Wales? We're here in Tenby on the south coast to find out why. So, what is a walrus? A walrus is a type of marine mammal called a pinniped, which also includes your seals and sea lions. The word walrus comes from the Old Norse, hros valor, which means horse whale. But here in Wales, we call walruses walus, but sometimes we call them morfa, which means seahorse. Not that kind of seahorse. So a walrus's tusks are super long canine teeth, so they're basically water vampires. These teeth grow continuously throughout a walrus's life and can reach lengths of up to a metre long. So what does a walrus use its teeth for? 
Well, walruses are part of a genus called Odobinus. Genus Odobinus. And that comes from the Greek word odus, meaning teeth, and baino, meaning to walk. Because a walrus actually walks on its teeth. Walruses use these teeth to haul themselves up onto the ice, as well as keeping breathing holes open. But you also use them to defend themselves against polar bear attacks and also against other walruses in mating display battles. <laughs> All walruses have a moustache which is made up of sensitive whiskers called mystatal vibrissae, which is similar to the whiskers of a cat. These whiskers can grow up to 30 centimetres long, but over time they get worn down as the animal is searching for food on the seabed. They're so sensitive, they can find an object that's only three millimetres in size. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Once a walrus finds a shellfish, they wrap their big powerful lips around it and they draw their tongue into their mouth really quickly to create a vacuum. And they suck the creature into their mouth straight out of the shell. And in fact, a walrus can eat up to 70 kilograms of shellfish a day, which is the equivalent of 280 Mars bars. So why is there a walrus in Wales? So globally, there are about two or three subspecies of walrus defined by where they live. So Wally here, he's not a Welsh walrus. He's actually an Atlantic walrus that is normally found on the coastline of Canada and Greenland. So what is he doing here in Wales? So walruses normally live around 40 years, but Wally here, he's quite young. He's only three years old. And so mating isn't at the top of his priority list. He doesn't need to be anywhere where other walruses are. So it's more than likely he followed the food here. Sounds like a man after my own heart. <laughs> it has been suggested that one of the reasons Wally may have turned up here in Wales is that he fell asleep on an iceberg and actually drifted all the way here. It's extremely unusual to see a walrus this far south and his appearance here reflects how climate change has impacted animals across the planet. As our climate gets warmer, we're going to start seeing animals change their normal geographic ranges, putting them in closer contact with humans. If you fancy coming to Tembe to see Wally, then can we ask that you don't be a Wally? Walruses are large, powerful animals and can stampede or become aggressive if spooked. So they're highly sensitive to noise and disturbance. So please don't be like those silly people that have been annoying Wally with drones and jet skis. And as nice as it would be for Wally to stay and hang out with us here in Wales, it'd be much better for him to go back to the Arctic and rejoin his herd. Incredible Oceans is a non-profit organisation and we rely on the revenue from our channel to keep making these videos. So when we say hit like and subscribe, it really does help us out. Then make sure you like and subscribe. Press those buttons, the buttons, press the buttons. There we go. Wow, amazing video, go. Russell. I, before you get into that, I've been involved, we should really invite Anne back because we're running a little bit short on time. So let's hop over to Anne real quick. He's going to carry on the live stream. Hello, everybody. I'm here. I have been fascinated with these videos and learning moments. And I'm so excited to get to all of the questions that are coming in. But first, we want to let folks take a selfie with you, Russell and Sophia. Maybe I'll call it a selfie. So <laughs> educators, friends, folks who are listening in, gather your students gather your your children gather whoever you wish or who's watching in front of the screen in your classroom at home on your devices and snap a selfie be sure to tag us at flipgrid and of course tag our friends at incred oceans we'll give you a moment to get set up and while you do make sure to share these on social we'd love to celebrate these learning moments with you Again, you can tag Flipgrid <laughs> and, of course, our friends in Cred Oceans. All right. Smile. Russell, I love it. 
Sophia, epic smile. I'm working it. I'm working it. Oh, yeah. So cool. Oh, friends, that's so cool. We would love to see these and celebrate the learning moments with you. Definitely, please, please, please feel free to share them on social. And again, one more time, tag Flipgrid and Incred Oceans. That's short for Incredible Oceans. <laughs> All right. Russell, Sophia, we're going to ask a quick question. Our friend Alice is watching with her dad, Lanny, in Wales, and she is curious about the sand from her local beach. It's getting washed away, and she wants to know, is this something she should be worried about? Russell or Sophia, I don't know who wants to take this. Russell, can we start with you? Okay, yeah, sure. I was going to say, well, Sophia's the earth scientist, but I'll, I'll have a go. Um, so, uh, yeah, sediment on the beaches. What happens, unfortunately, is that where, if there's a tourist beach and all, people want to, like, go and chill out on the tourist beach, they quite often build things to catch more sand to make the beach bigger. But then what happens is that beaches next to that beach, they don't get as much sand, which causes that erosion to happen. So what tends to happen now is governments and like local like states and federal places will be like have plans in place to make sure that doesn't happen as much. But still, sometimes they do something called a managed retreat where they're like, you know what? It's costing too much to look after this beach or this cliff. So we're just going to let nature take its course and do what it has to do. There we go. So, um, Sophia, any thoughts? Yeah, I think just to, to follow on from that, um, it's definitely worth checking with a local authority to see if it's maybe part of a bigger plan and then you won't need to worry. Because sometimes, like Russell said, they do plan on doing that and, and it is for a reason. But ultimately, it's sort of an effect of climate change, like we were talking about with the coastlines here in England. So definitely good question and there is some reason to be concerned but the chances are it's part of a bigger plan oh what's well, the thank next you. question Anne? yeah oh. that's a great question and russell and sophia we're actually getting a lot of questions about climate change and we'll come back to them in just a minute but first we want to show everybody how easy it is to find your content inside the discovery library Today's topic of the day is called Reduce Your Carbon Footprint. And we're going to show you that in just a second. But Sophia, can you let educators know what to expect when they use your incredible discovery library page from Incredible Oceans? Yes, I can, Anne. So our discovery library partner page is called Incredible Oceans. We're going to run you through how to get to that in just a minute. But we've got lots and lots of video content, just like the ones you've just seen, all about different amazing animals and under the sea processes, things like climate change, why our planet looks the way it does. And each one of those videos is accompanied by a short description, which has got three learning outcomes for you guys and also three tasks. So you can make your own short video at home showing us all your amazing tasks and outcomes and you can all do it as a class with your teacher um so definitely always share on social media and share through the flipgrid platform we'd love to see it especially things about animals that might be local to you awesome sophia thank you so educators and parents as you're listening in i want to show you how easy it is to find these flipgrid topics so your learners can reflect on today's time with Incredible Oceans. All you have to do is launch your web browser and type in aka.ms slash walrus. This will take you directly to Incredible Oceans Discovery Library page, and that's where you find all of the incredible content that Sophia just told about. Once you're there, you'll notice right at the top of their list is that topic, reduce your carbon footprint. You'll find when you click on it, this is where those awesome questions for your students are listed. They can respond to them. You'll find information on how to use this topic. And of course, you see that small blue button that says add topic. Once you click on that button, you can choose how you'd like to add this topic either as an individual discussion topic or add it to a group. And think of your Flipgrid group as your classroom. 
You can edit this as needed and customize the topic to make it meaningful and unique for your learning community if you wish to. And of course, then the fun begins. When you use this topic, your students are able to reflect on those questions and submit their own video responses to share their learning with you. And they get to use all of those fun creative effects inside the Flipgrid camera. So be sure to check this topic out right after the event. We're going to post the link in the chat for you that you can simply copy and paste. And remember, you'll see reduce your carbon footprint right at the top of Incredible Ocean's Discovery Library topic page. And now we're going to get back to some more questions. questions. Um, so Sam, yeah, Sophia, this is from Adeline who's asking, does climate change affect where animals live? I'd love to hear your response on this. It really, really does affect where animals live. So a lot of what climate change is going to do is it's going to give us more extreme weather. So that means sometimes it's going to be much hotter and sometimes it's going to be much colder. And for us in the UK, we're going to get a lot more rain, which I don't think it could rain any more. But to be honest, some animals really like lots of rain and that's really good for them. And some animals really don't. So animals in the UK that maybe aren't used to having a lot more rain, they're going to move if they can. So birds, for example, are going to move somewhere where there's less rain. Not all animals have got the ability to fly, though. So ultimately, if there's lots and lots of rain and they're not used to it, they could end up dying out, going extinct. We could end up with none of them left in the UK. So there's so many different possibilities of what's going to happen to our animals as we kind of go through the next 10, 20, 30 years of our climate getting warmer. Um, so we'll see. But lots of people are doing good research on it. So. Thank you, Sophia. Russell, this next question is for you. Mrs. D's class is listening in and they are curious if there are laws in place to protect whales and walruses from being captured and put into aquariums. That is a really, really good question. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's kind of frowned upon now and it's becoming a thing that's not OK to have uh, whales and dolphins and walruses in aquariums because we realise that they're really intelligent animals. We realise that they would normally travel vast distances like I think something like a killer whale or an orca would travel over 100 miles at least every day. And so you can imagine what it would do to them, putting them in a little tank. And then we've got the whole aspect of like whales and dolphins what I talked about in the first video about how they use sound to see. So you imagine if you're in a swimming pool sized tank and every time you make a noise, that's going to echo off the tank and it's going to be really loud. You're just going to be bored. It's going to be like you're a prisoner, basically. So uh, some aquariums still ha have captive dolphins and things like that for to help them recover if they get kind of tangled in the net or they get hurt or they get washed up on the beach but countries like in the uk i don't think we really have those anymore occasionally you might see a seal or a walrus in an aquarium but again these are we're slowly fading them out unfortunately other countries like china and russia and a lot of the middle east do still have dolphin shows and things like that which hopefully if we uh keep kind of applying pressure and signing petitions we will get those closed down and get the animals rehomed to a sanctuary so Russell, to follow up with this, is there something we can be doing at home in our own space to protect whales and walruses and other sea creatures? Something that we can be doing uh, is a, a one really, really easy way is if you like eating seafood, it's really important that you make sure that it comes from a sustainable source. And it will say on there, there's a little badge, which is from uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, MCS, and it will say MCS approved. And that means that it's it's a sustainable as a fish like like large scale fishing can be what's even better if you happy happen to live near the coast and you can go down to a harbor you can get it straight from the local fishermen that's even better but bit really kind of thinking about where the seafood comes from and having more of an idea about what we're eating and how it got on our plate is really crucial not only in protecting yeah. fisheries but also protecting our environment
Absolutely. And you've got to think about it. If we're eating all the fish out of the sea, what's left for the whales to eat? You know, so we've got to be really careful about how much we fish the oceans. Oh, that's fascinating information. Thank you. So, Sophia, another question for you. Hajira is asking, how does climate change affect farms or our food? And um, what can we do to stop and reduce climate change? So with food is a really interesting one because we don't realize all the time how far our food has traveled before it gets to our plate. One of the best things that we can do is eat as locally as possible, which might be a little bit tricky if you're in the middle of New York City, but there's lots of ways that you can check how many miles your food has traveled. The more miles our food has traveled, the more carbon it's putting into the atmosphere. And that's the biggest issue, really. Um, in terms of climate change affecting farms, we are starting to see farmers use different crops because the temperatures are different, because it's raining at different times of year. And they're also starting to use crops that are a little bit more resistant to changes in temperature, especially really big, abrupt changes so that they make sure they are producing enough food and that that is going to grow really healthily in their field. So it is going to have an impact on them as well. Yeah, Great one question. Of the that, that is a good question. One of the things that happened here is obviously Halloween. Everyone wants a pumpkin. And all the pumpkin farmers here were like, oh, this is great. This is great. We're going to have a really great pumpkin season and there's going to be loads of room to buy at Halloween. And then all the weather changed and it wasn't right for, for growing pumpkins and all the pumpkins ended up dying. And then there was hardly any in the shops here. And so the pumpkins that were for sale were really, really expensive or we had to bring them in from other countries. So, um, yeah. Unfortunately, this is what climate change means. It means more extreme temperatures. It's going to switch from being hot and cold, dry and wet, mm. and it's going to be drier and wetter more often. And it just messes up with all the crops. So, yeah. Mm. Hmm, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing those insights. Russell, this one is for you. We know you love sperm whales. So one of these students, Pratham, is asking, what do they eat other than giant squid? Do you know? They giant squid is like their absolute favorite. That's like what they go for. And but not just giant squid, they they all there's lots of other large squid species like colossal squid and Humboldt squid. All of these they absolutely love. And if that sometimes they might eat a big fish or something like that, but they're, they're all about the giant squid and that's what they kind of go for. So, uh, yeah. So you don't have to worry about being eaten by a sperm whale unless you are a giant squid and you hang out at 2000 meters underwater, which is great. Oh my, goodness. oh my goodness. This has been so fascinating. Russell and Sophia, I can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise and your passion for life underwater with us. I wanted to ask if you both have any final thoughts or inspirational messages you'd like to share with everyone watching. Oh, I think go out there and have adventures and see what's in the ocean. Go and sail and sit by the beach and look after your well-being, but mainly have adventures and see what's in the sea. That is one of the best things that you can do and that will inspire you. You don't even you won't even need us to inspire you. You won't even need our videos if you're watching it in real life, but obviously go check them out as well. <laughs> Awesome. I mean, I'm going to say the same thing. I, I love swimming in the sea, even when it's cold. I think it's so much fun to go and somebody, like, oh, it's really cold. And then uh, be like, oh, OK, why did I do that? But then you're like, yeah, that was so cool. I totally went in the sea. That's amazing. So don't just wait till it's nice and warm. There's so many cool sea creatures. Uh, I would like get involved with uh, a local charity that maybe has something to do with the sea or wildlife protection, something like that. Um, because, you know, you guys are the future. My old people like me, we messed up the planet and it's up to you guys to sort it out. So, yeah, you need to take the future into your own hands and sort out the planet so you guys can have a good future. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. Taking all of those learning adventures and creating positive impact. Thank you, Russell and Sophia. Today has been so special and it's been so awesome to learn with and from you during this last half hour. Thank you. Thank you. And friends who are tuning in, 
Today is actually the last Flipgrid Live event of this season. It has been an absolutely incredible year of learning, exploring, and discovering together. We are so glad that you have had the chance to learn along together as a global community. Please, please, please feel free to share your favorite moments from the year and Remember this, we will be back in August. And all you have to do is make sure and bookmark aka.ms slash Flipgrid Live Events. You can check back and register for our weekly events in the fall. And of course, don't forget to check out Incredible Ocean's Topic of the Day. It is ready to use now on their Discovery Library page. And finally, if any educators or parents are listening in and you want to learn how to get the most out of Flipgrid, feel free to join us next week for Flipgrid Live on June 28. Flipgrid Live is a free digital event where we get the chance to celebrate you and your amazing work. And we're also going to be sharing amazing new features that are coming to Flipgrid. You can go to aka.ms slash Flipgrid Live to register today and save the date, June 28. You are all invited. Friends, we wish you a beautiful day and want to say thank you so much for diving in and learning with incredible oceans at today's Flipgrid Live event. Take care. We'll see you out there. Bye.